You're listening to TIP. Welcome to The Good Life. I'm your host, Sean Murray. When we look back on our lives, we can all point to experiences that transformed us. Experiences so impactful, they shape who we are and change us in significant ways. My guest today is Lori Paul. She's a professor of philosophy at Yale, and she's written the book, Transformative Experience, that looks into these kinds of experiences and provide some interesting ideas to guide us and help us when we confront a transformative choice. Anyone who's interested in the good life will inevitably confront these kinds of decisions. In fact, these decisions are the big ones, the ones that can make all the difference. So it's worthwhile spending some time thinking about how to approach them. COVID is the kind of disruptive event that can lead one to such a transformative choice. So I think this conversation is both timely and relevant. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Lori as much as I did. My friends, I bring you Lori Paul. You're listening to The Good Life by the Investors Podcast Network, where we explore the ideas, principles, and values that help you live a meaningful, purposeful life. Join your host, Sean Murray, on a journey for the life well lived. Lori, welcome to The Good Life. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, your book, Transformative Experience, is about life experiences that are so impactful and have such a profound effect on our lives that we really transform. We become, in some ways, a different person, and we see the world through a new lens, and potentially our values and preferences change. And sometimes these experiences are thrust upon us, like surviving a near-death experience or maybe losing someone close to us. But more often, and what you really get into in your book is when we decide to undergo some kind of transformative experience, and you explore this, and it's a fascinating read, you talk about and really explore a dilemma that we face when we consider transformative experiences. And I thought we'd start with what a transformative experience is, because you have a fairly well-defined definition of that, and you have an excellent, fun, I'd say, thought experiment at the beginning of your book that has to do with vampires that kind of brings us out. And I thought we'd start with that. So what is a transformative experience? So I really like to illustrate the idea with a thought experiment or a kind of a fictional case, and philosophers like to do this generally. So let me run through the example, and then I'll try to outline the conceptual structure of the philosophical point. So let's imagine that we're in Europe on summer vacation and exploring various kinds of medieval architecture. And as I go down into this interesting dungeon, all of a sudden, Dracula appears. And I find this kind of exciting and incredible. And then he says to me, look, I think I kind of like you. I'm going to give you an opportunity, a once in a lifetime chance to become one of my followers, to become one of my own. I'm going to give you a one time only chance to become a vampire. So, I think this is amazing, right? And I'm sort of floored by a possibility. And he then follows up as I'm kind of standing there kind of shocked and says, look, I know you need a little time to think about it. So go back to your Airbnb and think about the possibilities. You've got till midnight. And if you decide that you want to take me up on my offer, leave the window open. I'll come to you. It will be painless. And you'll have a beautiful new life before you. If, he says then a little more ominously, you choose not to take me up on my offer, then leave and never come back. So I have this opportunity. So I go back to my Airbnb and start reflecting on the possibilities. I call my mom, I start texting my friends. And it turns out, after I talk with them a little bit to tell them about what happened, that they all confess to me that they have already become vampires. And after I especially like kind of get mad at my mom for not telling me, but she was like, well, look, I just couldn't tell you, you wouldn't understand. It's an amazing new kind of life. And then I say, well, look, should I do it? You know? And what my friends and my mom tell me is that, look, you'll have amazing new sensory powers. You'll have all these kinds of physical abilities that you never would have had when you were human. You'll look fabulous in everything that you wear. So there are lots of pluses. I mean, you have to drink blood. You sleep in a coffin. People will regard you as an undead monster. But those, are, you know, those negatives pale in comparison to the positives, and you won't even care anymore. Importantly, you'll just laugh at those kinds of things. You'll enjoy the taste of blood. So after I hear the positives and the negatives from them, I'm just thinking about it and say, well, what should I do? 
And, you know, what is it like? I mean, what is it like to be a vampire? Is this something that I really want for myself? Is this how I should live my life? And over and over again, I ask my friends, I ask my mom, everyone who tells me that they're a vampire, and they all say the same thing. Well, look, there's no way for you to know until you actually do it. They say, take it from me. I think it's fabulous. I know you'll be happy after you do it. So go ahead and do it. Life will have meaning and a sense of purpose that it never had when you were human. Take my word for it. So that's the thought experiment. And the question is, like, what should I do, right? What did I do? (laughs) And the concept that the thought experiment is supposed to illustrate is that sometimes you can be faced with life-changing experiences and you have to make a decision about whether you want to undergo this life-changing experience. But it's not just about it being life-changing. In the cases that I'm interested in, these are new kinds of experiences, like a kind of experience that you've never had before. And it's the kind of experience that you have to have it in order to really know what it's like. And if you're faced with a life-changing experience where you can't, in the most kind of intrinsic or essential way, know what it's like until you undergo it, how are you supposed to prospectively or think about who you would become or the nature of your future life in order to make an informed decision? How are you going to do that? It's an an important part of this is that maybe I know from testimony that, oh yeah, if I do it, I'll be happy. But there's an interesting question that comes up immediately. And that is like with these vampires, like, should you trust vampire testimony, right? Like maybe there's something like evolutionary or something that, you know, rewires people so that once they become vampires, they're super happy with it. But right now when I'm making the decision, I'm not a vampire. So why does it matter that the person who I'll become or the undead monster that I'll become thinks being a vampire is fabulous. What matters when I'm making my choice is what I think. Yeah, it's a very interesting dilemma. And as outlandish and fun as the thought experiment is, what you really bring out in the book is that these dilemmas are a lot more common than we think or that we face these situations. Now, I haven't yet been asked to become a vampire, but I have faced a number of these choices where I think about my future self and I try to imagine my future life and I'm at a a real disadvantage. You point out a couple different ways I'm at a disadvantage. There's the fact that there's information I don't know about my future self that I really can't know until I become that person. And I'm trying to make decisions about my preferences and I've got my preferences today and what I want in my life, but I'll also have new preferences in the future if I change and become a new person. That's a real dilemma. So what am I trying to optimize here? How do I think about this? Exactly. And so I want to just point out an extra wrinkle, which is sometimes we think, well, I can kind of step back and take an overall view and evaluate that future self that I'm going to be from my vantage point now. So like right now, I might think, well, I don't want to become a vampire, right? I just don't, I don't like the kinds of things that vampires do. And if I thought that that perspective was going to stay constant, through the change, then I would know what to do. But the key here is it's not just like my original thoughts that now are going to change. It's basically, one might say, my higher order preference is all the way up. Like what I prefer to prefer is also going to change, right? So it's not like later on that higher order perspective of like, oh, it's kind of just bad to be the kind of a vampire kind of person or vampire kind of thing. That's not going to stick around either, right? All the way up the chain, I'm going to think being a vampire is fabulous. I prefer to be a vampire. And In some sense, I prefer to prefer to prefer to be a vampire. Like it's good all the way up, right? And if you really have like that kind of a switch, then what you don't have then is kind of what I would describe as a kind of cross temporal consistency. The self that you are now is just not consistent with the self that you'll become at that later time. And our decisions assume that we will be the same self in the relevant way over time. And that's kind of the crux of the problem. Exactly. And you also bring out the point that the testimony, we can't just ask other vampires because we don't know if their testimony is something that we can rely on. Like you bring up a good example in the book about, let's say, taking a drug, a certain drug that once people take the drug, they feel a kind of ecstasy all the time, but maybe they become very lethargic. They stop pursuing their goals. They stop doing some of the normal activities that adults would do and responsibility and whatnot. But yet, if you ask them, oh, this is great, you know, this is the life, and we certainly wouldn't want to take that drug, right? We don't want to be in that situation in this vampire thought experiment, even if we are getting the sense that this could be fabulous. 
there's aspects of this new vampire life that really appeal to me. And I think it's going to be great. And we talk to vampires and we're getting a lot of positive feedback, but yet we can't trust that. And so there's a lot of epistemic, you call them, or knowledge-based problems in facing this decision. So let's stick with vampires before we broaden to other aspects and kind of other parts of our lives. So what else about this challenge should we be thinking about to become a vampire? What, how else should we be thinking about this decision that you face and you have till midnight tonight to make it? So what are you going to do, Lori? I mean, I'm in a bit of a pickle. There's another element of this that I, I think makes the problem even harder, and that is the testimony also told me, well, look, there's something that you can't know. Like You can't know the nature of this new life until you actually live it. I sometimes compare it in other cases like to the possibility of, like, let's say you were congenitally blind and then had the chance to see or let's say you had to, were able to taste this very interesting new flavor before you've actually had that taste or before you've actually had the experience of seeing, there's something that really important that you just don't know. And becoming a vampire by stipulation is also like that. So normally when we think about making decisions, we try to, at least not in all cases, but in these kinds of big life decisions where we're trying to think about possibilities for ourselves, sort of imaginatively project ourselves forward like into the different situation. Let's say if you were choosing between two different, I don't know, two different vacations, like, do I want to go to Paris? I'd love to go to Paris. Do I want to go to Sydney, Australia? I would love to go to Sydney. So maybe I have to think about, and I imagine myself in Paris doing all the amazing things that one can do in Paris. I imagine myself in Sydney doing all the amazing things that one can do in Sydney. And then kind of compare them and think about how I respond to that imaginative assessment and make a choice. Which one do I value more? Which one seems better? That's what you can't do in this situation. So you can't resolve the situation by accurately imagining yourself as a vampire. I can't because I don't know what it's like. And so you think, well, then maybe I'll think about the testimony, right? But then, wait a minute, there's also this problem with trusting the testimony. And even if the testimony is trustable in the sense that those vampires are right, that I'll be super happy being a vampire, what can I infer from that fact, right? Ordinarily, you'd think, well, if I was the same person, then of course, the fact that I would be happy is an argument that I should do it. But if who I am changes as a result of the experience, and what it's like to live that life is only knowable if I actually undergo the change, then how am I going to think about the possibility? And here is where we start having to think about what philosophers call sort of decision-making and decision theory, right? Normally, you think about your options, you assign them values, you look at the likelihood of the different options, like what are my chances of making it to Paris? What are my chances of making it to Sydney? Let's say I choose Sydney, Australia over Paris, because I think first, I just think that I'm reasonably likely to get there. And I just think I want to just kind of go to Bondi Beach and hang out, right? And I make that choice rationally because ordinarily, because I know enough about my different options and I can maximize my expected value by going to Sydney. But in the vampire case, I can't imaginatively assess the situation. So I can't assign in any accurate way what it's really like life as a vampire, what that's like. And because of the self-change involved, I can't rely on some of the ordinary decision-making efforts that I would use. So how am I supposed to decide? Okay. So you just covered a lot of ground there from decision theory, and I want to unpack that a bit. So when we make these kinds of traditional decisions, like your example of vacationing in Paris versus Sydney, we use expected value. That is, we estimate the probability or the likelihood of each outcome and multiply at times the value of that option, or we assign that option of value, how well it meets our preferences. And in this case, we do that by running a little simulation in our head where we imagine ourselves in each location and sort of match that up against our preferences. But the problem with the vampire case is we can't run the simulation. We don't have enough information to know what it's going to be like to be a vampire. So we can't use expected value. And to your point, we can't rely on the testimony. And that's a problem. So what are you going to do, Lori? I say change the decision. At least that's what we have to start thinking about. Change how we're going to regard these decisions. Don't think about making the choice based on the testimony in a straightforward way. Don't think about making the choice by projecting yourself forward and assessing what it's like. Instead, recognize that you can't know some of these very important things. And then effectively, I have to choose whether I want to discover what it's like to become a vampire. Do I want to end my life as I know it now and replace myself effectively with this new vampire self? knowing that I don't know what it's going to be like. And so there's kind of a, it's a gamble. 
of a very distinctive sort. Yes, it is. And it's this art of becoming a new person that really is the choice that we're making if we go down that path. It's discovering who we are, as Nietzsche said, becoming who we are. There's something about that discovery that makes life meaningful, gives us purpose. And there's also something authentic about it because it's our choice. What you bring out in this example is that I think we often fool ourselves. We think, well, I'm just going to make the rational choice here. I'm going to weigh all my options. I'm going to project into the future. I'm going to run my simulations in my head. And I'm going to look at my expected value and look at all the probabilities and outcomes and everything. And what you really broke down for me as I read the book was just that there really is no logical way through that maze. That at some point, in my mind, I sort of lift it up to the soul or to the spirit or to intuition in some way that the rational mind is not going to be able to solve. And I think that's a really important discovery and something that our society doesn't do a good job of preparing us for because I think it sort of tells us, oh, just make the rational choice. You also break down the argument of scientific research. Oh, I could look at the scientific research. Well, that doesn't work either. You know, I don't know if you want to talk about that. So what do we do, Ori? Let's go back. Have you decided yet? I mean, it's getting close to midnight. You said you're going to avoid the decision, you said, or go around the decision. Well, how are we going to do it? Let me touch back on just a couple of things that you said. You're right that what's important, I think, for me in the book and also in some of my later work is to try to look at this carefully and with precision. In other words, I do think that there are real issues here about intuition and authenticity and how we should think about constructing ourselves. But I want to start out by taking the decision theory and the decision theoretic perspective very seriously because I endorse rational decision-making in many contexts. And the thought is that there's actually a precise way to say that there's a problem. I said it sort of intuitively, but I'll just say, if you can't assign value to the outcomes, there's a way in which you can't kind of build a model in the precise way to kind of calculate how best to maximize your expected value. And if in addition, the individual who or the agent who's making the choice changes like who they are as they choose then there's a kind of violation of a certain kind of fundamental axiom of kind of constancy that's sort of at the root of this puzzle. So the thought is that, in fact, there's a technical decision theoretic way of raising this problem. So the way that I want to say when I'm texting my mom furiously or whatever, you know, midnight is approaching, what I want to say is, well, we need to change the model. And if we change the way we think about the model, then we do start to get closer to the things that you were talking about, like understanding that what we're doing is choosing to replace ourselves. We're choosing to make a certain kind of discovery, to discover who we are. And that's if you value that kind of discovery, even if you're taking a risk because you don't know what you're choosing, right? Again, in an important way. I mean, you're choosing this new self and human psychology is a beautiful thing. We tend to be sort of satisfied with who we are in lots of different ways. So the odds are with us. However, it's possible that you would make a choice to become a new self and that this new self would be less happy, less satisfied with their life than the old self. And that's a risk you have to take. So what you're saying here is when we choose the transformative experience, we're essentially saying, look, there's things we don't know about how this is going to play out. But what I'm choosing is to become a new person. And that's really the choice I'm making. So yeah, the thought is that we step back We recognize what we can't know and don't try to fool ourselves into thinking that with a little bit of testimony or some more scientific information or some good guesswork, we can just sort of straightforwardly solve the puzzle and instead say, yeah, we can't, there's stuff we can't know. That's a big part of like living a life that's informed. Like it's, it's part of wisdom to understand that certain things you can't know and certain things you can. And when you make a choice to know what it is that you're choosing. Exactly. And if there wasn't an unknown like that, then would life really be interesting? Would we really have the unique human experience we're having? I think there's some real value in the unknown and in embracing the unknown. To make a connection to the lives of many of my listeners, what immediately came to mind as you talked about the vampire example, and you even talk about this in the book, is the decision to have children. I agree with you. It's personally transformative. It's epistemically transformative. It's very similar to what you described with vampires in that we talk to our parents. We want to know 
And what's it like to be a parent? We talk to our friends who are parents, but we really don't know. I have two kids, so I've been through that transformative experience. But you're right. There is a real gap there that temporally between our current self and our future self when it comes to having children. And it's something that many of us face in our society today. And I think in the past, we didn't really face it because of birth control and because of culturally and all the other reasons why it just sort of was a path in life. But now it becomes a choice. And it's sort of a modern challenge that we have to overcome some of these transformative decisions. So maybe talk a little bit about that connection and how we go about making a decision like having children. Sure. This is one of my favorite examples. And it came about for me partly because I have two children. And especially after when I had my first child, I was wowed by it in a certain way and thought, wait, there are a lot of philosophical ideas here. And none of my philosophical contemporaries seem to be talking about them. And in fact, if I looked at the history of philosophy, there just wasn't a whole lot of discussion about these questions about you know having children. And then, okay, so there's something here that I really wanted to investigate as a result of that experience. And that's right. There are intended connections between the vampire example and this example. Let me run it this way. I think there are a couple of different ways to think about choosing to have a child and becoming a parent that have lessons for us. But let's look at the case where like, before you become a parent, you think about it, you ask your friends, you ask your family members or whatever. Maybe you see people, you babysit a little bit or things like that. And people tell you that you'll be very happy if you become a parent. And so you choose to become a parent. And lo and behold, you are happy. And you, you might think, oh, all along, I knew what I wanted. I knew what I was in for. And because, of course, I, was, I made the choice and I looked forward and thought about things. And then look afterwards, there I am testifying to how happy I am as a parent. In that case, I would argue you still were transformed. You still made a huge discovery when you formed the, what I think of as an identity-defining kind of attachment relation to your child, which changes at a very deep level, I think, who you care about most. You just change your own preference, for, I think, for life satisfaction and self-preservation and replace it with caring about the child. And then this iterates out into all these other kinds of things. And even if consistently you wanted to become a parent and before you made the choice, you knew you wanted it. After you made the choice, you're happy you did it. I would still say you replaced yourself. And so it's not that you had some underlying clear perspective that was somehow just magically revealed, at least in most cases. It's rather that, interestingly, who you were beforehand was one kind of self that wanted to do it. And then who you are afterward is a much more informed self who's also happy that they did it. But it's not like there's some kind of straightforward path from one to the other. Now, this comes out when you think about somebody who doesn't want to become a parent, right? And asks everyone and they say, oh, you'll be so happy if you do it, blah, blah, blah. And then they become a parent. Maybe somebody gets pregnant by accident or whatever. Or they get kind of convinced to do it in some sense, even against their inclinations. And then afterwards, they're super happy to be a parent, right? Now, is this person just experiencing cognitive dissonance? Or was it like that they somehow just didn't know what they really wanted in their heart of hearts? I mean, maybe. But I think it's a lot more plausible to think that at least in lots of cases, this is just a good example of like someone's self was replaced. And here it just becomes apparent. I think it's really important to bring this out because people, I think rightly, like people who choose not to have children, for example, can feel insulted by being told, well, you'd be so happy if you became a parent. And they feel insulted because they're like, look, I know who I am and what I want. And just because I would be happy if I had a child isn't a reason for me right now to have a child. And I think they're absolutely right about that. It's just that you have to be super clear about the conceptual structure to explain why they're right about it. And there are other cases, but I like, I like to compare these two cases. And you can see the connection to the vampire. I mean, aside from the fact that you don't get sleep much at night, when you have <laughs> the idea is that there's this kind of very revolutionary change and it changes who you are and in an amazing way when you have a child. But just because there's lots of testimony about it and just because you can see people around you kind of becoming happier that by itself isn't really, I think, the right way to think about choice. Exactly. There's so much about that experience that I found personally rewarding. But I think the revelation in your argument in reading the book is that we have this, is it called a hindsight narrative? We like to tell the story of how we made the decision or that it all fits together when really we didn't logically look at all of our choices and make the best choice. We made a choice to become a new person and gamble and take that risk. And we were rewarded in some way. At least I was in my experience. Most, a lot of people are that have children. Interestingly, if you look at the research, the happiness research, I think you cite Kahneman and maybe Deegan and some of these other economists that have uncovered that many people who decide not to have children are as happy or maybe even a little happier. I just had Jonathan Clements on the podcast. He's a personal finance writer for the Wall Street Journal or was for years. And 
he mentioned that too, almost in passing. He has kids and he said, I find this hard to believe, but it came out as far as how we spend our money and, and how we find happiness. So the research is even maybe going the other way as far as happiness, yet it's not just having children. That's another thing I took away from the book is that you start looking at your career choice. You start looking at going on a 10-day silent meditation retreat, potentially could be transformative. I mean, these decisions are out there. Yeah. So hindsight bias is a real thing. We tend to look back and think, oh, I knew all along what I wanted. And I mean, I'm not saying that that isn't the case sometimes, but I think an awful lot of times it's just not the case and we don't see it. And the thing about how the happiness research, and I think that research is evolving and it turns out it's like quite specific with respect to countries and cultures and things like that. But there's an interesting feature about having children that involves a kind of suffering. And, and my colleague, Paul Bloom, and I are very interested in this. Uh, Paul is a psychologist and developmental psychologist and super interesting, great thinker. And we have been talking about how there's a kind of suffering involved in becoming a parent. There's a way in which maybe thinking about happiness isn't quite really what's going on. We choose a kind of suffering because there's a kind of joy that comes along with it. And it's just not even clear, I think, that there's a straightforward kind of comparison to make between the kind of happiness that, and satisfaction that someone leads, lead a child-free life, and the kind of satisfaction and happiness that a person leads when they have a child-filled life. I mean, they're just really different. And they may also be different because of a different balance between joy and happiness and suffering. And maybe our preferences adjust so that in a certain way, we don't mind the suffering as much as parents, bizarrely, right? Like someone said, hey, I'm going to stick your hand in this boiling pot of water and you know what? It's going to hurt, but you're not really going to mind it that much. Like, you know, I don't know, you could take some Percocet or something, right? I have a broken arm. I was given Percocet for a couple of days and it was very interesting. Like, I just wasn't worried about the pain, you know? So it could be something like that. Is that appealing? No, it's not. But it seems like something like that happens when you become parents. That's a really, really interesting insight, I think, the idea of the suffering involved in parenthood and the meaning that we can derive from that. It reminds me of Viktor Frankl's work with Man's Search for Meaning because he talks about the suffering. He was obviously, for those of you who aren't familiar with Man's Search for Meaning, is Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychologist or psychiatrist, I can't remember exactly, but working in Vienna before World War II started. But when World War II broke out, he ended up in a concentration camp and surviving and writing a book about it. And he talked about the meaning he found in the suffering, and it was deep meaning. It helped him survive. He also found if he had a purpose, it helped him survive and potentially children could help us with purpose as well. And you talk about the unselfish nature of the love we have for our children and our willingness to even put our life down for them, which is a, like maybe an ultimate sacrifice. So I think that there's something there. I'd be interested in the work you've done there if you've followed up in your book since then on papers or whatnot that we could read about, because I think that we can derive meaning from suffering. I think we can define meaning from suffering, and I'm, I'm still working out some of my thoughts about that. But one way, and just to go back to the question you were asking about when we make a choice, I think we can find meaning from choosing to either remain at the self that we are, so say rejecting the transformation, or choosing to become a new self, like choosing to become a vampire, choosing to become a parent. And the meaning comes, maybe, I mean, obviously it comes, I think, from having a purpose, but I think it can also come from just the kind of, I thought talk about the kind of revelation involved in making a discovery that is associated, I think, with like just a feature of the way we live our lives. Like what it is to be human, for example, can involve becoming a parent. It doesn't have to be like there are other ways to be human, but that's just one very distinctive, interesting way to live one's life. And discovering that can be rich and revelatory and amazing. I think other things you can do too, like you can choose a particular career, then you're discovering a way to live your life and a way to kind of be in the world that I think can be incredibly interesting. And especially if you choose a life where you give to others, those kinds of discoveries connect for me with the way that we develop our minds, the way that we explore the world, and also the way that those two things interact so that we can construct ourselves so that like when we live a life and construct a narrative through forming ourselves over and over again with these transformative experiences, there's a kind of authenticity out there and there's a kind of discovery. And for me, I think that brings us a kind of meaning. Absolutely. Have you in your research come across people that are more inclined to continually 
transform or continually reinvent themselves? Because we often learn so much from people that are living in the extremes. Have you come across someone or a lifestyle that's the continual reinvention? I mean, I think about Picasso or are certain artists that we look up to, it seems like they sort of lived on that edge in some way, or that through art, we're sort of creating and transforming. I don't know if there's a connection there too, but and I guess we have to suffer to create art, but just curious if you've, that line of inquiry has gone anywhere. No, that's interesting. I mean, I think you're right that one of the really interesting things about an artist is they are constantly creating and often they're creating new works of art, but there's a lot of one's identity is, I think, contained within the art. And so that sort of self-expression and arguably self kind of recreation would be a good example of someone maybe who is really devoted to sort of transformative experiences as a way of life. I came to this partly because I love new experiences and I've definitely undergone transformative experiences in my life in several different ways. And I think all of us have in various ways, but I may have had more than others. And and I've always been puzzled about how to make those choices and noticed how interesting the transitions were and how little I really knew about what I was getting into. But also I find it valuable, but I I'm saying, no, I haven't come across anyone in particular, but I think the ideas are interesting. And I also want to compare it to the kind of person who rejects uncertainty and who finds value in kind of the steady state and not changing. Because I think that's also, like, this is not a judgment that it's always better to seek the new. In fact, it can be a lot worse to seek the new. Like, I'm not arguing that this strategy of finding new things is necessarily good. It's just a kind of life that involves a distinctive kind of revelation and a distinctive kind of valuing. But if you like a life that's very, very steady, that doesn't change, and you value that constancy, right? And that's another way to find value. And I respect that too. Yeah, that would be the other extreme. I think that's really interesting. I don't know if that's a monk who lives in a meditative state, almost in the silence, or you know, there's people in religious orders that live a life that's sort of like that, where it's this, almost the same every day, and they're praying. And I think that would be really fascinating too. You've got a chapter in the book called The Shock of the New, Talk a little bit about that. What is the shock of the new? So this goes back to what I was saying earlier about what I think of as the intrinsic character of lived experience. And I'm interested in this. I mean, I also do philosophy of mind and I'm interested in the way that we experience the world and come into contact with properties of the world. It relates to consciousness, but my interest in consciousness is not what many philosophers are interested in, which is what's called the hard problem of consciousness. Like what's the relationship between the brain and the mind? And I care about that. But what I'm especially interested in is just how we, as conscious experiencers, kind of interact with the world and discover its properties. And again, in a sense, like receive meaning and insight just from discovering these properties. Like, I like what you were saying about meditation and the monks, because I do think that there's a way in which the contemplation, where you're focusing on often just basic qualities of the world, trains you to extract a kind of insight and meaning just from exploring, like one might say, the texture of those particular properties, the silence or even some mundane thing like a teacup, right? The idea is that you learn how to extract something important from the way that the mind kind of makes contact with the external world. And I've just always been fascinated by that. So the thought is that when you come across a new kind of experience, like say seeing a new color for the first time, or the example I like being blind and then gaining sight or being deaf and gaining the capacity to hear ordinary sounds or to hear music, that's super interesting. Like I think that's really interesting for the mind and it's a huge discovery. It's not necessarily good. People who are congenitally blind, I think often they lose amazing abilities if they gain vision. So there's a trade-off here. I'm not saying it's automatically good. I just think it's pretty fascinating. And discovering new qualities of the world, I think, can just be intellectually valuable and intellectually interesting, even when they're bad qualities, actually, going back to the suffering, right? Like sometimes experiencing pain in various ways or the pain that maybe you would experience through caring for someone else or for sacrificing something about your life for someone else, that also can carry value partly because of what it's like to do it, not just for the good that it does in the world. So as we think about these transformative experiences through journaling, is that something that can help us temporally connect the two selves that we're dealing with here? You know, by writing in decision theory, we often talk about keeping a decision journal, right? And talking about the reasons why you make a decision or what's going on in your life when you make the decision. 
So maybe we do that before a transformative experience, and then we know we're going to transform. What I like about your book is I really feel like now I, I know I'm going to transform. The next time this decision happens, I'm going to look at it a little bit differently. I'm going to think, okay, I'm going to be a new person in the future. And so I guess what I'm saying with this writing example, Lori, is that I sort of want to write a letter to myself in the future and remind my new self what it was that brought me to that point. And is that something that you've explored or talked to people about? I love that idea. Not journaling in per se, but I'm interested in, I mean, I think that nostalgia in general, some of the emotions we feel when we have certain kinds of experiences can help us to make the kinds of contrasts and comparisons that you're talking about. So journaling seems like one way of doing it. If you think about when you go back to your childhood home or the example of Proust with the mat, like dipping the cookie into the lime blossom tea, I think it was, the thought is that you can create an experience somehow that calls back something to your mind and allows you to simulate a past experience. And so reading what you were writing might be able to to do that, right? Having other kinds of experiences might be able to do that. And I think the value of that is that it can help us to understand the sort of change that we underwent. So it's not for the forward-looking thing that it's important, right? It's for looking back and trying to sort of draw, you know, wisdom from the changes that you underwent. And so yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of that. I write philosophical books and articles for a living. And it's partly through writing about these things and thinking about them that I learn about them for myself. I mean, it's not like I understood this project when I started writing about it. I think I still don't understand it. I'm writing about it all the time and I'm still trying to figure it out. In closing, can we go back to this idea of becoming who we are? And I think that the big takeaway for me in thinking about transformative experience and the way that you write about it in your book is that when I face a transformative experience, a decision, if I decide to undergo it, I will be deciding to become a new person in some ways. And that part of the value there is my, I authentically decided to take that step. And I'm sort of authoring my life or we're authoring our lives when we do that. What else can you tell us about becoming who we are? Is there another way to think about it? Or how do we become who we are. I guess it seems almost like an oxymoron, but there's something there. If we're just thinking about time, of course, you become who you are over and over and over again. But the thought is that you make choices right, that affect the way that who you are in the moment, because your past causes you to have the present that you exist in. And part of what I'm hoping people will think about more is that First, there's a way in which you have responsibility and you have authenticity in making choices where you choose kind of knowledgeably to become a new self. Even if you don't know what that new self is going to be like, you know, in a different sense, what you're doing. But also, and this also relates to the work of Hannah Pickard, who is a philosopher at Johns Hopkins, who does really interesting work, distinguishing between basically kind of praise and blame and responsibility in the sense that you can be responsible for being who you are, making certain kinds of choices. But that doesn't mean, especially if you make a mistake, that you should be blamed, right? Or maybe not even praised either. Like There's a sense in which you take responsibility for who you are when you make these choices, I think, in an informed way. But you know that, again, that what you're doing involves a lot of uncertainty and unknowability. And that gives you a kind of freedom because then you're not going to look back and say, oh, I made such a mistake. I should have known better. I regret making this choice. Well, no, you weren't choosing knowing like what it was going to like, be like to see or knowing what it was going to be like to be a parent. You were choosing to discover this. And maybe it wasn't quite what you thought it was going to be, but you shouldn't choose it thinking that you knew what it was going to be. You choose it so that you can discover. Yeah, that sort of takes the stakes down a little bit when you look back at your life, especially when things didn't work out the way you thought. There was uncertainty there. You chose to become a new person in some way, and you didn't know how it was going to unfold beforehand. This gets back to that hindsight bias. We sort of think that, oh, that was the way it was meant to be, or that was the way I should have known it was going to turn out that way, but we really didn't, right? That's an important distinction to remember. You really didn't know how things were going to work out, that you made a decision based on the information you had at the time and projecting ahead to the future self that you were going to be and all those things, but you really didn't know how it was going to play out. And that alone kind of psychologically can free you up to, you know, maybe discover a little bit more, maybe be a little bit more human or freeing when it comes to your next decision. And more tolerant, both tolerant of yourself and of others' choices. 
Well, we've come to the end of the podcast, Lori, and it's got to be close to midnight in your vampire thought experiment. So what are you going to do? I'm not telling you whether I'm a vampire or not, but I did have a disco inferno dance party last Halloween. I think we can infer from that then what happened. We'll see. Lori, where can people find out more about you and your book and your writing? My website at Yale, it's www.lapaul.org. That's my personal website. And you can also find it if you look in the Yale philosophy department, there's a link there. And I have a lot of links to articles and some media things. And and if you're interested, you can read my book if that's appealing or listen to some of those podcasts. And obviously, our discussion, I think, has been super fun. It was really fun for me as well. Thanks for being on The Good Life. Thank you. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.